What's up guys, I just got back from flying a sortie and I wanted to take a minute to introduce this video. In this video, I would like to talk about the anti-G straining maneuver and G tolerance in a little bit more detail than I have in previous videos. For a little bit of context, let me show you before I take this stuff off, some of the gear that I wear on a regular basis. As you can see here, there's a survival vest that houses a bunch of gear that we have to carry with us. And then down here is the G suit. when you hear me reference the G suit, that's what we're talking about in terms of something to flex your legs against under G. So you can keep that gear in mind throughout the description of the anti-G straining maneuver and some of the assumptions that go into that discussion. Hey guys, welcome back to my humble temporary home. It's been a while since I've been through the initial training and evaluation that fighter pilots receive on G tolerance and resisting G forces in the jet, but the practice is something that me and other fighter pilots are always refining and perfecting throughout a fighter pilot career. If you Google the topic, you get a range of results from totally obsolete and out of date information all the way up to current implemented modern information. So hopefully I can clear up some of the confusion on the topic and talk about some focused fitness measures that contribute to success under G loading. Real quick, I want to establish a working definition of G forces. I don't intend to go into a bunch of scientific detail, but I do think it's important to have at least a, a working foundation for maybe those people out there who don't quite understand what we're talking about when we say G-forces. G-force or gravitational force is actually a measure of acceleration on an object. In the case of this discussion, we're talking about the fighter pilot's body as the object that pulls an object toward the center of the earth, for those of us who live here on earth, and indirectly produces weight and the sensation of weight for that object. On the ground, we experience an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared, and that acceleration is opposed by the ground that we're resting on, which prevents us from descending into free fall toward the center of the earth. And that opposition results in the force of 1G on our bodies and is responsible for the weight that we feel on any given day. Sitting in the air, it's the aircraft itself that opposes accelerating forces on the pilot, since hopefully I can't just fall straight through the seat of the aircraft. As the aircraft accelerates, most commonly through aggressive angular accelerations or through aggressive turns that result in aggressive angular acceleration, a pilot experiences increasing g-forces and increasing weight against the seat. These forces often approach 9g or nine times the force that we feel on a given day just sitting at rest on the ground, meaning a 200 pound individual can briefly during these moments weigh up to and including 1800 pounds. Pilots most often talk about G-forces in the aviation community accepted Z-axis, that is relative to the spinal column. G-forces that would give the sensation of something pushing down on you, proceeding from the top of the canopy straight down through the spinal column into the seat and then out the bottom of the aircraft as though you're being pushed down in the seat. At least those are the most common G-forces we're talking about when you hear pilots discuss G-forces and G-tolerance. Physiologically, what happens in high G scenarios is blood is forced out of the brain. And as the brain is pretty sensitive to cellular hypoxia, which is the scientific term for not enough usable oxygen, the short-term result is G-induced loss of consciousness or G-lock. Once the body's own compensatory mechanisms to try to keep blood pressure higher and try to deliver oxygen to the brain start to fail. Unconscious pilots are historically poor at combat aviation and often meet their demise defenseless against their adversary or unfortunately against the ground as they're unable to continue to control the aircraft. So when we talk about G-forces for a combat pilot, the critical point here is to devise a way to maintain not only consciousness at a baseline level, but also useful consciousness that would allow continued clarity despite all the blood wanting to run away from the brain and down into the lower extremities. How can I stay awake and functional when my body weighs nine times its normal weight and my brain is literally in danger of shutting off for a bit? Aerospace physiology and aerospace medicine has really come up with several answers to that question. And I wanna delve into four categories of answers right now. The first being equipment. Let's talk about the G suit that fighter pilots wear and that you saw in the intro. Conscious, physical, physiological resistance or the anti-G straining maneuver. 
in order to resist loss of consciousness. There are fitness adaptations, which I'm concerned with for the purposes of the scope of this channel, and things that fighter pilots can do in the gym to improve G-tolerance and that they should be doing to improve G-tolerance on a regular basis. And finally, I'll talk briefly about some nutrition considerations as well as supplementation and its role in increasing G-tolerance. You saw briefly the G-suit that I wear, that everyone in my squadron wears, and that G-suit is representative of the new wave of G-suits that replaced a G-suit that I used to wear with somewhat reduced coverage compared to the current A-tags or Advanced Tactical Anti-G-suit. That old reduced coverage G-suit was thought to provide somewhere between a G to a G and a half of protection, and I mentioned that briefly in the squat video that I posted from the Deployed Workout series. And this new G-suit that we wear is reported to provide somewhere between half a G to one full additional G of protection over your resting G tolerance. In studies on the new G suit and its implementation, pilots themselves reported anywhere up to and including a 50% reduction in G fatigue, meaning the ability to rebound to previous G tolerance following a G onset period or a G onset episode and somewhere around a practical average of 2.4 additional Gs of protection. Now, when we talk about G protection from a G suit, that's compared to a baseline resting G tolerance, which is measured for fighter pilots in a centrifuge at rest without an anti-G straining maneuver to determine that individual's G tolerance simply as a baseline measurement. So if a G suit provides two and a half Gs of protection, let's say, in a nine G environment by combination of their resting G tolerance and their anti-G straining maneuver, the fighter pilot has to resist the additional six and a half Gs in order to maintain consciousness and useful consciousness in the cockpit. The way the G-suit works is it is connected to a hose in the aircraft that pumps bladders in the G-suit full of air in order to compress the legs and drive blood out of the legs and prevent it from pooling in the lower extremities. That in combination with some of the other measures that I'm going to talk about, particularly the anti-G straining maneuver, help keep blood in the brain for the purposes of practical functional consciousness under G. The sensation is like wearing self-tightening pants that constrict your legs to a greater and greater degree the more G is put on the aircraft. With the protection that the G-suit offers, the suit itself is an invaluable tool to help build the overall protection that the pilot needs in the high G environment. And its nature as an automatic response is one of its key strengths in the combat environment. The next critical component in G tolerance and in G resistance training is the anti-G straining maneuver which from an aerospace physiology standpoint is instructed to become a subconscious maneuver that fighter pilots perform as G onset develops in order to aid the body at a physiological level with keeping blood pressure oriented toward the brain and continue to deliver useful oxygen there. The anti-G straining maneuver consists of two components. That is the respiratory component or the breathing component and the isometric contraction component or the flexing component of various muscle groups to drive blood back toward the brain. For the respiratory component, fighter pilots are instructed to fill but not overfill the lungs. So take a moderate nominal breath and focus on inhalation exhalation cycles that last less than a second and take place every three to four seconds. You may have heard of the hook maneuver whereby pilots pronounce the word hook or pronounce the first portion of the word hook, the who, in sort of a reverse manner in order to take in air and then pronounce the K of the hook in order to exhale and then go right back into the process for the next three to four seconds. That particular maneuver is not something that the Air Force teaches or the Air Force instructs and is somewhat of an outdated understanding of the emphasis of the anti-G straining maneuver. Whatever phonetic pronunciation may or may not exist, the emphasis is on drawing in the air and then straining the respiratory system against a closed glottis or a closed closed off airway, almost like bracing your lungs for knowing you were about to be punched in the stomach and that you're at risk of having the wind knocked out of you. This rapid cycle under the intense G pressure helps to quickly exchange carbon dioxide, bring in new oxygen, and also relieve excess chest cavity pressure under G so that the heart can continue to fill with blood and maintain the carbon dioxide oxygen exchange that's so critical to life. Practically, this sounds like an individual taking in air and holding their breath and then exhaling somewhat forcefully with that quick less than a second inhalation cycle in order to get air back into the lungs that are under immense pressure and wanting to release all the air that they have available. <laughs> or something like that. 
The second component of the anti-G straining maneuver is the isometric contraction portion, whereby the fighter pilot will flex key muscle groups, starting with the legs and up through the abs, pressing against the inflating G suit in order to drive blood back up toward the brain. The contraction of the muscles forces blood out of those areas in order to make it available to the upper extremities, most notably the cranium, for maintenance of useful consciousness. I mentioned earlier that this maneuver is something that is perfected over a fighter pilot career and refined over a fighter pilot career, and there are degrees to which it's implemented on any given sortie. Early on in a fighter pilot's career, it's much more common to utilize a very textbook implementation of the entirety of the anti-G straining maneuver, flexing as hard as you can the legs and the glutes and the abs and really focusing on precise inhalation exhalation cycles as a fighter pilot career develops with more and more experience the maneuver can be tailored to the g onset rate that a fighter pilot is experiencing as well as the duration of that high g episode so it may not be necessary in every given scenario to implement the entirety of the anti-G straining maneuver. There are times in fighter engagements where I might simply focus on flexing the glutes and the quads and keeping my abs moderately tight, and that may be sufficient to resist a slower G onset rate or maybe a high G environment that lasts only a few moments. The human body does have some compensatory mechanisms that it will implement without any intentional physiological resistance from the pilot, such as an acute increase in blood pressure. So with that in mind, the anti-G straining maneuver can be tailored down to its individual components, and those components can be utilized to varying degrees in order to maintain useful consciousness. The implementation of the anti-G straining maneuver leads right into a discussion about fitness adaptation, or G tolerance adaptation as it relates to work in the gym, which for the purposes of the scope of my channel is what I'm most concerned with. And really that comes back to things I've already talked about in the deployed workout series, specifically the video that covered the back squat with other points scattered throughout the series. In order to increase G tolerance, the focus in the gym should be on compound movements, specifically those that target the posterior chain, the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads, things like the deadlift and the back squat. From a resistance training standpoint, growing those muscles and strengthening those muscles only increases the capability in the jet to isometrically contract them. Even though the maneuver in the jet is an isometric contraction, the isotonic movements with which people are familiar in the gym still contribute to the strength and endurance of those muscle groups and their ability to recover from the fatigue of a G onset or high G episode. Cardiovascular training can also be important to supplement the cardiorespiratory system's capability to deliver oxygen to various parts of the body. Insofar as cardiovascular training also improves your work capacity or your anaerobic capacity, it can further support G tolerance in the jet, but would be insufficient in itself to overcome the severity of oxygen deprivation that takes place in the high G environment, and therefore the focus should be on heavy resistance training to develop those muscle groups that I already mentioned so that you can couple your body's cardiovascular capabilities with a strong and robust isometric contraction capability that will ultimately keep the fighter pilot conscious. And finally, as a brief point on nutrition and supplementation, nutrition-wise, just like going into any fitness-related event, it's important that your body has adequate fuel to accomplish the task at hand, which in the case of G onset should be treated like another anaerobic activity, another brief bout of very high-intensity exercise meaning your body's going to rely on glycogen stores that it has available to it. The same well-rounded diet considerations that you might give toward any sports endeavor, fighter pilots should utilize similar considerations to performance in the jet. A similar thought process should apply to supplementation use. So if a supplement would further your efforts toward a sports-related endeavor or high-intensity fitness-related endeavor, then chances are it could provide some practical advantage to G tolerance. Creatine is the most well-studied sports supplement and is one such supplement that has proven effective in sports and fitness related endeavors and therefore might prove effective for increasing G tolerance because of its ability to supplement the body's energy stores or provide the body with an additional avenue for ATP creation that provides the body with usable energy for high intensity athletic events. Other supplements provide some warrant for caution, particularly pre-workout type supplements that include vasodilators, citrulline in 
its various forms or nitric oxide, any compound which might result in decreased blood pressure due to vasodilation is actually going to hinder the body's capability to keep blood pressure high enough under heavy G, which could make it easier for the body to succumb to hypoxia in the brain. So while I will utilize pre-workout supplementation from time to time to aid my progress in the gym, it's something that I'm cognizant of with regards to my long-term G tolerance. And I accept that there may be some trade-off in increasing performance and building dense muscle in the gym that can contribute to my G tolerance, but also not going down a path that will ultimately decrease my body's capability to maintain adequate blood pressure under G. All right, that is everything that I would like to talk about in the anti-G straining maneuver video and its related components. I hope you enjoyed the video and got something out of it. Leave me your comments and questions and feedback below or send me an email to let me know what you thought and I will respond to you as quickly as practical. If you are enjoying the videos, the easiest way that you can show your support is to subscribe to the channel and also to like the videos that are helpful to you. And generally leaving feedback of any kind helps me tailor the content that I put on the channel so I can flow this thing into a helpful direction. I have been so appreciative of the subscribers thus far that have interacted with the channel. At the time of this video posting, I've got about 430 subscribers, which is an encouraging and humbling number to think about. The fact that that many people out there might find something that I'm saying useful or practical in their lives and in their fitness endeavors is more than encouraging. It's awesome that that many people might be interested in fighter pilot life and that's a momentum that I want to build on to give more people a window into not just staying fit for combat purposes and combat aviation but also fighter pilot life in general. In the future, I hope to introduce you all to my family and to standard home station operations, but all that will have to come when I get out of this place and have access to more than just my laptop and a camera. Until then, I'll keep putting together what I can, and I really appreciate all the support along the way. I'm putting together an idea or two for some sort of giveaway if and when I reach the 500 subscriber mark. I've got some things here that I have flown in the Eagle Jet over the combat zone, and right now I'm thinking I'll come up with some method of choosing a subscriber, probably somebody not in the fighter pilot community, and mail that person some of the swag that has been in the Eagle Jet over current operations. I'll keep you posted on that as we get closer to the mark, so please tell your friends and family about the channel and encourage them to get involved with it.